Thank you for joining us for this final event of our spring evening webinar series. We've saved the best for last, and I'm sure Clifford here would agree with me, and Clifford will be doing some introductions for us. As our guest speaker tonight is a scholar, globally recognized expert in international economics and development with extensive experience working across both the public and private sectors at all levels. The topic our guest, Dr. Marie Pangestu, will be discussing this evening is also an essential component of realizing our shared vision of building the kind of world we all want to live in, a place that's safe, prosperous, healthy, and one where we all have the opportunity to achieve full potential. Eliminating global extreme poverty is critical to that vision. And I look forward to hearing more about the ways to foster a global economic recovery. What a time for this indeed. That is not only robust, but is also green, resilient and inclusive. Of course, I have to say, we're, we are able to have these events and these conversations and host such accomplished speakers because of our wonderful World Affairs Council of Maine community and our sponsors. Thank you all for your support and your commitment. As a reminder, here's your technical training for the evening. You will have the opportunity to ask questions by using the Q&A function, or if you're more adventurous, perhaps using the chat. So don't forget, you have the opportunity to ask questions and we certainly do welcome them. Let me take a minute also to introduce this evening's moderator, whom I already referred to, Clifford, Clifford Gilpin who is a past president and longstanding member of the World Affairs Council of Maine. Clifford happens to be a 22 year veteran of the World Bank, working in Africa and East Asia. He managed the bank's human resources program in Indonesia from 1987 and 1992, and subsequ subsequently directed the bank's internal learning and leadership program. Clifford received his PhD from Columbia and has a special interest in global energy supply and consumption. So Clifford, would you please do the honor of introducing our esteemed guest? Yeah, thank you, Bill. It is certainly my privilege to welcome Dr. Marie Pangestu, uh, who is the World Bank's Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships to the World Affairs Council of Maine. She's born in Jakarta, Indonesia, and has vast experience with international organizations, government, and the track two processes in areas related to international trade, investment, and development across the world. She's also an accomplished scholar, most recently a fellow uh, at the senior fellow at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs a tenured professor of international economics at the University of Indonesia and leads Indonesia's premier think tank of public policy and international affairs, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta. She is active in multiple multi-layered forums, including ASEAN and the G20, and was an Indonesian cabinet minister for over a decade holding key portfolios like tourism and trade. Dr. Pangestu is invited to join the leader, was invited to join the leadership of the World Bank in early 2020 and reported for her first day of work on March 2nd of that year, only to find herself working from home after just eight days because of the pandemic. Uh, it's a testament to her expertise and leading leadership acumen, Dr. Pangescu has been instrumental in shepherding the World Bank's response to the global pandemic towards a resilient, green, and inclusive recovery. Dr. Pangescu, it is a genuine honor to have you with us this evening. And for me personally, it's also a special pleasure to be able to welcome you as a former uh, World Bank staff member. Uh, so I look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Clifford, uh, for these warm words uh, of welcome and introduction. 
uh, I really wish I could be physically there in Maine, but uh, I'll take a rain check uh, on a visit to Maine. Uh, I, I will share uh, my thoughts on, on the whole idea about how to recover uh, in a green, resilient, and inclusive way uh, in the developing country context. And it is really, uh, you know, all of you in the US uh, have been hearing uh, the, the, the theme song of building back better. Uh, uh, and, and it is the same idea, uh, but in a developing country context and obviously with different challenges and different uh, starting conditions, if you like. So, and, and green resilient and inclusive development and building back better has been really a part of the conversation uh, in, in, in countries as well as in developing contexts as well as, as globally. Uh, and really it's not just about building back better. It's also, I think about building back uh, better and differently to correct uh, uh, many of the, uh, I guess, fault lines that existed before the pandemic. So um, uh, my, my story uh, or my, the, what I'm gonna share with you is really uh, uh, about developing countries. So I thought I would start uh, with a bit of scene setting to understand where we are with uh, the situation of developing countries today uh, uh, you know, with the pandemic uh, and, and what the pandemic has had, uh, uh, the impact of the pandemic uh, uh, on developing countries. And, and just uh, to, you know, uh, Bill, you mentioned the, the shared vision. You know, the World Bank is a bank that works on development and the people in developing countries. You know, our focus is on the people. And it is about eliminating poverty and shared prosperity uh, for, for developing countries. So I, I think uh, this is why uh, our, fo our focus is obviously, first of all, how do we respond uh, in, in, to the immediate uh, crisis uh, from the pandemic? And, and really, I'm just going to give you uh, the, the, the situation that developing countries face today. And just by, uh, by uh, giving you the, the big thought, which is developing countries are actually now facing a dual crisis of climate change, as well as the socioeconomic fallout of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And if unaddressed, this means a lost decade of development and worsening in inequality between as well as within countries. So I'll give you a few uh, of, of uh, our uh, numbers, our analysis, our assessments. And believe me, I mean, I've been here uh, in the bank for one year, you know, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned, I came to report to work and then uh, not long after uh, working from home, but the whole bank has been working from home and, and uh, learning as we are doing. The situation is a fluid situation. Uh, so some of the numbers that, that we see coming out um, are not good, uh, but it, it, we need to have these numbers uh, so that we know and the analysis and numbers and context. So we know what is it that we have to do. So let me just uh, give you a few, uh, a few, uh, a few scene setting uh, numbers and, and visuals. Uh, first is that poverty is expected, extreme poverty, which is in the World Bank context or in the poverty world is defined as one, uh, $1.90 a day. So uh, spending of $1, below $1.90 a day is what's uh, classified as extreme poverty. It's likely to increase to 150 million people uh, by the end of the year. And this is like reversing decades of uh, what we have been able to achieve. Uh, it's the first time that poverty has increased since 1998. Uh, and COVID, uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, COVID pandemic accentuated structural challenges that existed uh, prior to the, the pandemic, whether it's debt overhang, lower productivity, slow investment growth, um, and low levels of human capital achievements. And uh, what, what we are really worried about is that we're gonna have permanent scarring on all fronts if we don't address uh, it now, as well as in, in a green, resilient and inclusive uh, development, uh, a recovery and growth uh, path to development. Uh, first, uh, the, why the, this scarring uh, happens is because there's so, so much inequality uh, and, and so much uh, variance of impact uh, across countries, across groups of people. And a lot has to do with the size of the firepower that you have. You know, uh, if you look at the stimulus programs that uh, advanced countries can uh, provide to their citizens uh, to, to, you know, 
basically provide a, a very wide and strong social safety net. Uh, you know, the, the stimulus checks, for instance, that, that you get in the US and the, and the stimulus to the businesses, wage subsidies to businesses uh, and so on. Uh, 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 advanced countries have deep pockets. So they, they can uh, have this very strong uh, social safety net. So if you want to know the numbers, uh, the amount of fiscal uh, spending or stimulus for advanced countries is 20%, 23% of GDP compared to 4% for developing countries. So there already you can see that developing countries are constrained in how much they can do uh, to respond uh, to this crisis. You can start with the health systems. Uh, you know, you need to have the emergency re response. Then you need to have the ability to contain, right? The testing, tracing, and the treatment. You need the equipment, you need the testing and the diagnostics. You need masks, you need gloves, and you need prot protective clo clothing, and now vaccines. So th this is uh, the affordability issue as well as the exist, the, whether or not they have a system is what we have been doing uh, as the bank uh, coming in to help countries. Uh, and, and you know, in, in various shapes and forms. Uh, that's the first thing you can do. And with vaccines, this is really uh, going to be uh, uh, really a, a big crucial question. And it's, it, it is a global question because I'm sure all of you have been following uh, the discussion on vaccines. Access to vaccines has been unequal. And, and you know, it's not just, and having unequal access to vaccines means uh, uh, the impact on your economies, uh, how long your economies are going to be in lockdown or, or having uh, potential breakouts and so on are going to be longer. And it means more damage, more scarring to your economy, to your people, and much, much longer for you to recover, right? So uh, it is uh, the access to vaccine, the unequal access to vaccine will also lead to unequal uh, recovery paths and development. So if you just want to know an, a number, uh, I'm sure if you have been reading the newspapers, uh, this number, uh, this number has been around. Uh, you know, out of the one billion doses that are around today, 31% is in the U.S., 13% in the EU, 10% in the e U.K. Only 18, 18 million doses went to the poorest countries. Africa is only getting 0.2% of this. Latin America is getting 2.5%, and so on. So uh, that is already uh, the uh, uh, one, I guess, uh, a very important, you know, the vaccine issue is, is kind of the prerequisite. If you, you don't even want to talk about recovery until you can uh, solve the, the issue on the health side. Uh, and then the other um, aspect of what we are seeing is that the, there has been an unequal impact um, uh, of the crisis, uh, even in, in advanced countries. Obviously, the poor, the ones who don't have the digital skills, the ones who are in sectors which are most impacted, they are much worse off. Uh, and in, in, in developing countries, they also are not uh, often uh, not able to get social protection programs because often they are not registered, right? They, 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 uh, they, they didn't have um, an ID. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the, uh, one of the issues we have had to deal with. And we actually have had situations where the country has had to very quickly roll out programs to be able to document the people who needed help. The, the crisis uh, uh, has also had a gender impact. It, it has a differential impact on women, whether it's because most of the health workers are women, women have to stay home and take care uh, of the family, children not going to school, uh, those who get sick, they lose jobs and income, uh, and they are in the sectors that are most impacted uh, by lockdowns, uh, you know, whether it's retail, hotel, or the informal trade sector. And they're also subject to gender-based violence. This is, you know, this is all based uh, on, on our assessments. Uh, we do surveys, we do uh, all kinds of assessments in different countries. And because the health system is focused on uh, the pandemic, uh, maternal and women health services are, are you know, not being uh, paid attention to. And we have seen uh, also girls being married uh, at a younger younger age uh, and, and girls not going back to school where to the extent schools are opening up. And in past a pandemic like the Ebola, uh, that was also uh, seen that uh, after the Ebola crisis was over 
a lot of girls didn't go back to school. On human capital, the other uh, health service that uh, also declined is child vaccination. And then you have learning losses from uh, school lockdowns. I mean, it's all fine and well, you know, here uh, everybody's struggling with online school uh, and, and having your kids at home and teaching them online. But imagine in a country where, in, in many countries, in, in developing countries where they don't have digital connectivity, how do they learn? You know, so remote learning uh, takes a very different meaning uh, in, in developing countries. So the, the way we describe it is you have to develop uh, tools and content, train the teachers, uh, train the parents in, in a way that is very different uh, uh, in, in different situation with no tech. No tech usually means at the minimum transistor radio or SMSs, low tech. Low tech can be, uh, you know, communal one laptop or, or, or TV, and then uh, high tech, where where you can have them um, similar to what you have here with online learning. And this is the learning losses from school lockdown is really really um, scary. So the World Bank has this uh, measurement called learning poverty. What does it mean? It means uh, how uh, how whether a ten year old can read and understand text in a simple paragraph. So before the pandemic, learning poverty was 53% uh, of, of the 10-year-old uh, population. Um, and uh, now we expect it to go up to 63%. And this is, you know, a lot of this is irreversible. So, uh, and the final thing I would say is that uh, the, the, the economic sectors in, in developing countries, whether it's SMEs, informal sector, and sectors that are, you know, like many economies are very dependent on tourism, uh, they, they will be uh, probably uh, decimated and, and very hard to come back uh, to, to have a restart. So uh, that's kind of the, the economic situation, um, the dire economic situation that developing countries face. Of course, you have uh, from very poor countries, middle income and higher middle income. So it, 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 there's a variance there, but I'm just sort of giving you a little bit of the, of the general sense. And then we have climate. Uh, we have climate affecting the very vulnerable population and regions, whether it's floods, we've had floods in Bangladesh, we've had look at, at the same time that this pandemic is happening, we had the locust uh, issue in, um, in Africa that destroyed food crops, uh, and so on. And, uh, and, and this will lead to 130 million more people entering into extreme poverty by 2030, if we do not address uh, climate. And we all know uh, science, the science on climate is telling us we are re reaching irreversible tipping points. The last four years is the warmest ever. We, we are seeing uh, the melting of icebergs, rise in water levels and so on. Um, so, uh, and, and as our assessments also show that climate actually hurts the poor, the poorest and the most vulnerable country more. Uh, and within the country, the poorest and the most vulnerable more. So it, uh, climate um, impact has a, a very uh, unequal uh, impact also. So uh, that's the, the kind of the setting. And then we, if, you, if you think about the pandemic, the, the COVID uh, virus is zoonotic, meaning that the virus goes from animal to human. And why uh, we, we are uh, seeing lots of analysis also, why is there more interaction between animal and human? It is because of you know, the encroachment of urban uh, dwellings to conservation area and so on and so forth. So there is a climate uh, issue there. And, the, and as I said earlier, climate change impacts on growth and poverty. So what does that story tell you? It tells you that uh, we have to uh, realize the interlinkages between planet people and the economy. And that is why uh, uh, we, we really need uh, uh, to, uh, have a response that is whole of economy and society approach for a green, resilient and inclusive recovery and growth that recognizes these interlinkages and addresses them simultaneously and systematically. So um, uh, what does that mean? Okay, and, uh, and, and people say, oh, we've talked about green, we talked about resilience, we talked about inclusive before. So what's different? What's different is doing it in a systematic way and recognizing the interlinkages and addressing them simultaneously. I'll try to give you some examples so that you know uh, what I'm talking about. But uh, you know, in general, what does this mean? 
Green means investing in solutions that sustain natural capital and growth and job opportunities, which will drive transformative investments and, and just, transitions, just transitions in key systems like energy. I know Clifford is interested in energy. Uh, there are systems, uh, you know, we identified uh, energy systems, food and land use and agriculture, transport and urban infrastructure, uh, manufacturing. These 90% uh, of G, uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from these systems. So uh, can we think about a world where, uh, you know, because if you go to a, if you, if, I went, if you came to me when I was minister and said, minister, you have to do green, resilient and <laughs> inclusive development, I'll say, uh, yeah, but I have to create jobs, you know, uh, and, I, and I have to feed my people. So you're telling me I have to address climate. Uh, if I, I can't address climate if I, if I can't create jobs. So the whole idea is how can I address climate green and at the same time create growth and job opportunities, right? So this is, uh, this is really uh, uh, what, um, what, I mean, what, what if you hear uh, Joe Biden talk about the clean energy, uh, initiative in the US, he talks about the number of jobs that are being created. But you have to be think about it as also a just transition. What about the jobs lost in the coal mines or in the oil industry? How do you uh, deal with them? So in, in a developing country, situation is the same. You know, you're asking countries uh, to, uh, to, to, to transition and to transform. Um, and uh, and a resilient, what is resilient means? investing in risk management to prevent and prepare for climate change, pandemics, and socioeconomic shocks. So uh, a lot of vulnerable countries uh, uh, are very prone to, to climate uh, shocks, uh, whether it's because the coastlines uh, have been uh, eroded uh, or uh, their, their ecosystems have been uh, affected. Uh, so it, you could it, you have to invest in uh, in adaptation and and building back the, the resilience, uh, and of course for pandemics, uh, what we do now to build out our health systems is not just for this pandemic, but for future pandemics. And then how do you deal with those who fall into poverty? You know what is the social protection program that is uh, that is um, uh, important? Inclusive. What does inclusive means? You've got to invest in human capital and foster policies for inclusive growth to create jobs and address inequality. So um, how do you make this happen? Uh, you need to invest in human, physical, natural, and social capital. And countries need to have the right investment policy, climate uh, policy, and policy certainty with uh, the appropriate uh, economic and structural policies, and also have the institutions to, to be able to attract the capital. because. The, the financing is not going to come, just come from government budgets or external uh, financing like the World Bank. It's going to have to come from private sector. Uh, and for that, you need to create the right investment environment. And you need technology uh, and innovation. A lot of the climate solutions uh, are there. Uh, uh, the technology is there. Uh, how can we get uh, that technology to countries? And most importantly, and this is where the Global Affairs Council should have a discussion, uh, that's fine and well. Developing countries are being asked uh, to do this, uh, and uh, uh, they don't have necessarily the resources or the technology. So they, they're part, the issue of partnerships and global support uh, for resource mobilization and technology access is really uh, what we are talking about. Um, and uh, you will need to have the mobilization of capital at, at scale, especially from the private sector. So some people are, are calling this, we need another Marshall Plan uh, uh, to, to reconstruct uh, the, the, the world economy, especially the, the two thirds uh, uh, that are making up uh, the developing countries. And global support, uh, uh, I'll end on this, uh, global support, uh, I'll end on two points. The global support is not about just helping developing countries because you want to eliminate poverty and have shared prosperity. That is the shared vision. But actually, uh, uh, helping developing countries is about achieving the global goals of climate and economic re recovery for the world, not just for developing countries, so, which benefits all, uh, including and especially the advanced countries. Uh, why? Because two thirds of greenhouse gas emissions come from uh, developing countries. Developing countries now account for 36% of global GDP and 55% of global growth. 
So if, if uh, developing countries are gonna have a lost decade of development, you will have more damage on the climate and you will also not have growth for, for globally, right? So uh, that is really uh, uh, what, what we think is, is the, the, the most important argument why there needs to be global partnership uh, for resources uh, and technology. I forgot to give you the examples, but maybe I'll stop here because I think I've done my 20 minutes. But if you wanna know uh, how it, this can be done, uh, what does it mean to achieve green resilient and inclusiveness? I can give you uh, some examples. Clifford, you're muted. Sorry, I have to unmute myself, yes. Thanks, Marie. Um, well, yes, actually, one of the things that I, I read that struck me in some of your earlier comments was that uh, when we take, speak about climate, um, I think you said uh, on, a, on a number of occasions, nine out of 10 natural disasters are actually water related. And that struck me as a very interesting uh, comment, something that sort of made me sit back. What, what are the implications of that? And how, how might the bank confront that? Yeah, um, water related meaning that you are, you are, you know, we have 1 billion, peop 1 billion people living in flood prone areas. Uh, and then you have uh, all the issues with, you know, uh, urban uh, urbanization affecting water, water sources, uh, uh, waste management that goes into the rivers that affect the water. Uh, and it affects uh, agriculture. It affects, uh, you know, the, the 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 frequency of floods and natural disasters like uh, tsunami or or any of these uh, weather related uh, disasters. Uh, they tend to be uh, water related. That's why nine out of ten. So uh, I think what we need to do is uh, we do have a, a, a huge water program. How do you uh, address uh, the issues at the source? Uh, how do you address issues of, of waste management? How do you address issues of uh, restoring coastal and, and seascapes? Uh, and and th maybe that's a good example uh, that I was going to try to give you. Uh, how, how can you achieve green resiliency and inclusiveness? So uh, a, a lot of our, uh, what we call uh, stimulus programs right now in the recovery, in this phase of response and recovery you want to create you want to to create jobs for the people who have lost their jobs and income so a lot of countries have give cash cash transfer but also cash for work program so uh, an, uh, we are in a number of countries like costa rica indonesia what we're doing is we're working on re restoration of landscapes and seascapes uh, in indonesia for instance is mangroves and uh, coral reefs so you're creating jobs in the restoration uh, of these landscapes and seascapes. And at the same time, when this is done, you are going to build resilience against uh, natural disasters, against uh, climate damage. Um, and also uh, in, 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 in many instances, you are creating also the carbon sink, like mangroves absorb uh, four times more than forest, a forest scape, for instance. So you're restoring the mangrove, and when you restore the landscape, de degraded uh, landscapes, um, and uh, and also think about uh, crops that are maybe using less water, mm -hmm. or, uh, or not you're not using fertilizers, which are also damaging uh, to the environment uh, to uh, with CO2 emission. Uh, you you build back, you know, you, you're making the land uh, more productive, and then when the farmers who who would probably do the cash forward program. They can then use it for farmland to grow crops with higher yield and higher productivity. And at the same time, you can introduce sustainable uh, food and food systems and uh, agriculture practices. So that that's kind of an example of of, of the getting the triple benefits. Uh, so if you have if you are as a government, you have limited budgetary resources, and we as the bank, we want to come in and help a government to spend effectively. That would be an example uh, of, of a program that would achieve uh, all three. And this is this is so. If you think in, with those three uh, elements in mind um, in, in implementing your policies, uh, that's what we mean by green, resilient, and inclusive uh, recovery. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, that's that's an interesting example. Yeah, one of my, I think it leads me to another question, which is, you know, we chatted about this a little bit earlier. The bank, over its uh, long existence from 1945 to the present, has gone through a number of transformations and. In some cases, the bank has actually decided at some point to move away from certain kinds of support or assistance. Um, and of course, uh, I mean, hydro dams would be a good example of that, right? But um, in the current situation that you've mentioned in these news crises, are there areas that the bank is now reconsidering or where we would want to do less of something, but more of something else? Um. I think we will still focus on human capital, uh, education and health, because uh, you, know, you cannot have development without uh, addressing the, the people issue, right? Uh, but uh, you're right on it, you know, we, the bank has been moving away from infrastructure actually, uh, including dams. But now I think what we're gonna be doing is have a big push for sustainable infrastructure. Hmm. Uh, I'll give you, I know you're interested in energy, so I'll give you an example with energy. Uh, and, and how it has to be green, resilient, and inclusive. So uh, when you talk, take something like energy infrastructure, uh, you know, 90% I, I, uh, of, uh, well, uh, I think it's about, maybe half of that 90% is come of the CO2 emission is coming from energy. And a lot of that is coming from coal, uh, coal uh, fired power plants. And a lot of that is in actually in my part of the world uh, in, in Asia. So. Uh, when you talk about, okay, energy transition, so for CO2 emission reduction and addressing climate. But if you're only addressing climate uh, and you're not looking at resilience and inclusive, then you will come up with a very different solution. We say, okay, let's just close down all the coal plants, right? Uh, uh, but that doesn't work. Why? Because uh, the, the poorest countries only uh, emit 4% of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And two thirds actually come from uh, the, the major uh, emitters, the, the major middle income countries. Mm -hmm. So how you address the poorest countries is many of them are in Africa where electrification is only 50%. They don't have access to electricity. Uh, it's not about uh, closing down coal plants uh, in, in those countries. It's about, okay, I need energy. I need electricity to develop, to, to get out of poverty. What do I do? That's the inclusiveness part, right? Uh, uh, is it hydro dams? Is it, is it uh, uh, renewable energy? So in, in countries where it's an access issue, the question is what kind of energy sources must you provide to them? And, uh, and, and co not coal though. Uh, World Bank stopped lending to coal ten, uh, since 2010. So not coal. So if hydro cannot work, if Renewable energies cannot work because usually, you know, you don't, you can't get the the huge uh, base load for the grid. Uh, then what? Natural gas, nuclear. So uh, nuclear is, prob you know, uh, <laughs> controversial. So natural gas maybe uh, at, at the moment we're having a big a, a discussion on that. Natural gas seems to be the the bridge fuel. Even in the U.S., they talk about it as the bridge fuel. Uh, because it's still cleaner, the cleanest, um, uh, and, uh, even though it's hydrocarbon source, it's still cleaner than coal. But you've got to you've got to use the technology that can do the carbon capture and storage and all that, and be able to repurpose it. This is the new technology that's coming on stream, but still not viable yet. Hydrogen, right? So you've got to be able to repurpose it. In countries where there's lots of coal fire power plants, and you're talking about China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, those are actually the main uh, use, but apart from uh, the US and Europe, uh, in developing countries, you are talking about transitioning out of coal uh, into what? <laughs> Same question. But then how do I close down these uh, plants? Uh, how, what is the just transition? So this is actually what we are uh, talking about now in the bank. So this is, I would say, that's a new direction uh, of travel for the bank. Even, but we haven't, uh, uh, you know, we are uh, a lot of uh, people are discussing this. But we do need the, we we will need the technology, and we will need uh, a large amount of resources to this, and we will need the private sector uh, to come in. And then how do you get uh, all the bits uh, in? Um, and at the end of the day, you know, you you are helping the people have clean energy. Uh, to develop, to grow, 
uh, and, and not have the pollution that's going to hurt them health-wise and productivity-wise. So, um, and so that, that's really uh, another, I, I'm just giving you another example of how we think about green, resilient, and inclusive. Yeah, thank you. You know, so part of your uh, areas of responsibility um, is actually policy development. I think a lot of people who uh, know something about the World Bank, perhaps they don't know very much about that aspect of it. But one of the things that makes the bank unique, of course, is that it's uh, compared with other access, other sources of financing, that we also offer significant uh, research and policy yes. advice. And yes. I think it would be helpful to people for you to say a little bit more about how that operates in terms of the, the kind of intersection between the policy work and the actual lending. Okay, uh, that's a really good question because actually right now, uh, uh, you know, the, the bank has been known as the knowledge bank uh, since uh, the time of Wolfenson. Uh, and I myself, when I was uh, in a policymaker, a minister, I used to get a lot of policy advice uh, from the World Bank uh, uh, to design my po the policies, do the reforms, uh, build institutions. Uh, and and uh, and it also leads oftentimes to lend financing, you know, lending from the bank, uh, like you know we got financing for doing uh, connectivity in Indonesia, for instance. But it started out with with a study uh, based on the the World Development Report. So um, the World Bank uh, is unique because we come uh, we 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 provide knowledge services uh, as well as financing, knowledge services, technical assistance. Uh, as well as capacity building and financing. Uh, so it's a package. Uh, so we, we help countries, de, you know, change their policies, understand what they need to do. Uh, sometimes it's just policy advice. It doesn't need, need to lead to uh, financing, but oftentimes it leads to financing. And all our financing is also uh, based on uh, analysis, right? Uh, that the, the, the funding is going to be used for uh, will have an impact uh, on development and, 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 and uh, reducing poverty. So uh, uh, I think that's uh, really a very important distinction. And right now, um, I'm uh, in, in my one year, I was, you know, I was uh, asked to join the bank uh, exactly for that reason. Uh, the president said, I want you to uh, make our uh, knowledge and financing uh, model work more effectively. So the, the interaction, inter intersection and interrelationship between knowledge and financing is, is, is there, but how do we make it uh, more effective? And I can give you many stories in my own experience as a user of how uh, uh, the, the, the policy advice of the bank uh, actually led to, to many of the, the good outcomes that we had in Indonesia. Could you give us one of those examples real quick, Marie? I think it would be very helpful for people to hear that. Uh, oh, I had many examples. Uh, maybe one example which which really got me into trouble because I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm a technocrat. I came into the into the government, a very innocent technocrat uh, with very little political savvy, and I have no political party behind me. And uh, I think within within one or two years of being Minister of Trade, Minister by the way, Minister of Trade is probably a very political position. And the big issue was uh, import of rice. Okay, so uh, uh, it's the usual food, uh, food self-sufficiency. Why are we importing rice? Uh, we, you know, we are a big country. We should be producing our own rice. We shouldn't import rice. But in fact, you need to import rice to stabilize the prices. Uh, and I was getting so much heat um, that uh, in the end, we, we, we uh, delayed uh, the, um, the, the usual import of rice. Uh, and uh, we also only imported a small amount. And guess what happened? The price of rice went up by 30%, uh, and poverty went up by 1%. And, and I had to build a case of why import of rice is, is a sensible policy. If what we're trying to do is make sure that we have enough of the staple and that we wanna uh, not hurt the poor people. So the bank helped me to do this analysis uh, that basically concluded that in a hundred years of Indonesia uh, history, uh, we only did not import rice three years in a hundred years because it's normal. You import rice when it's off harvest, 
right? When you when there's not no production and you have a shortage before the next harvest, and we only ever imported like less than five percent. That's that was uh, data point number one. Data point number two. Uh, by the way, the high rice prices don't help farmers because farmers are net consumers. They also have to pay for the higher price of rice to consume. So it hurts the farmers that you said, said, you know, the politicians were all up in arms saying, you, you're hurting the farmers, you're hurting the farmers by importing rice. I said, no, we're not, we're hurting the farmers if we're not importing rice and so on. So um, uh, they helped me to, to uh, build, uh, you know, build uh, uh, the analytical case for it. Uh, and, and I won the day using, using that. I can still remember, especially that hundred year uh, craft I presented that in the cabinet as well as in the parliament and everybody was silent. And then, and then I showed the link between the 30% increase in the price of rice and the 1% increase in poverty. So, you know, you're not helping, you know, you're making people more poor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great example. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to ask about is, you know, another part of your portfolio is um, the bank's partnerships with other organizations. And if we go back to the subject of the pandemic, of course, the bank has been involved, uh, presumably very, and you know, WHO is the one who's got Bill up and in the news, but uh, not always favorable, unfortunately. But how is the bank able to work effectively, in this case with WHO, um, in addressing the pandemic? Well, we, we have worked with the WHO from the beginning. So, you know, in the beginning, um, uh, we uh, we basically have had about over a hundred countries um, in, uh, uh, we designed what we call uh, a platform where uh, you could, okay, what do countries need? You know, in the first round, it was basically uh, medical equipment, uh, ventilators and oxygen, uh, mass uh, protective equipment. Uh, and, and, you know, just, uh, uh, well, there was a list of, what was called COVID-19 uh, products that are needed for the country to, to respond. And then health system, you know, what, what in the health system uh, do you want to help? So you, you kind of come up with like, it's a, like a menu uh, that, that we agreed with, you know, with the WHO, with the UNICEF and with all the partners. And that enabled us uh, to go out and say, okay, we, you know, we, we agreed with the partners. We had the, we had the financing and we also have uh, country offices as well as country people on the ground and UNICEF, World Food Program, uh, WHO regional offices, local CSOs, international CSOs, they also had people on the ground, Red Cross. So you work with whoever is on the ground uh, to implement the same uh, approach, right? So agree on the same approach uh, with the partners. And also the, the financing can be topped up by other multilateral development banks or regional development banks or bilateral or by the government, right? So that you are doing it uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, systematic way. So that's, that's how we approached it. And with vaccines, it's the same. Uh, we agreed uh, with UNICEF. Um, it, this is, I, I'm, I'm very proud of this because I think this is really, uh, <laughs> apart from the, uh, that there is not enough vaccines around, but what we have done is we've done this vaccine readiness assessment in 114 countries in three months together with UNICEF. We agreed with UNICEF. What, what does vaccine readiness mean? You know, okay, infrastructure, cold storage, uh, train workers, uh, legal issues about indemnification, uh, system. How do, you, how do you record the people who get the vaccines? Uh, communication, that's very important because of vaccine hesitancy and, and all that. So, you know, there's a list uh, of things that countries have to do. Uh, and we started with that. And from there, you can tell what is, does the country need? Where's the gap, right? And then you go in, you know what to do uh, when you go into the country uh, before they can receive the vaccines, they have to be ready to receive it. So we're working uh, with, with, especially with UNICEF because UNICEF is, has the expertise mm. in the area, but yeah. also with the WHO um, and many other partners on the ground, including uh, local, you know, local, local partners. Uh, because the, 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 the challenge is so tremendous that unless you do it that way is, is uh, important. And the final thing I would say is community, the role of communities. Um, I'm a great believer in, in, the, in the role of communities because you, you can talk about 
uh, whether it's the social cash transfer program or uh, social programs, social protection programs or vaccines. Uh, it is really the community, they know who, who is in their community, uh, who, who needs help, uh, who has vaccine hesitancy, who, whatever. They, they community, working with communities and uh, community leaders, uh, religious leaders, uh, this is really uh, a part of what we have to do. Yeah, thank you. That's good. Even in Alaska, I've read that, you know, where they have a lot of indigenous groups, that's been the key to getting the vaccine out. We have uh, quite a few questions, I think, from uh, our audience. So thank you. I'm going to pass this over to Alison, who's going to uh, um, read the questions. Okay, thank you, Clifford. Thank you, Mari. I'm going to start with Dakota Irving. And he is asking specifically about sustainable development in developing countries with regards to energy. Um, he does a lot of his work focused in Uzbekistan, which has begun an inspiring transition to renewable energy production sponsored by the World Bank and other in international financial institutions. However, many of the new solar and wind projects in Uzbekistan are being financed through public-private partnerships that will see foreign countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, own and extract renewable energy from Uzbekistan. Are there new models available for sustainable development that will break free from this um, system that is based on extractive foreign concessions? Um, so Uzbekistan is one example, but there are certainly others of this. Uh... I, I don't quite know what you mean by extract. I think I think you mean that it's extracted and then uh, sent yes. uh, out. Right. Uh, well, I think um, I, I I'm not. It, it must be a regional grid thing. I guess that's that's what what it sounds like. Um, I'm I'm not that uh, familiar with the details of Uzbekistan, but Uzbekistan is one of our reform champions. They have a very strong government that is very. Uh, reform-minded, uh, and on the energy sector, uh, if, if you think about uh, renewable energy, I'm not sure that they are also considering gas. Uh, but if you talk, just let's just take renewable energy. Uh, I think uh, most renewable energy uh, projects uh, really uh, need to be looked at as to you know whether it's going to be. Uh, economical in terms of, I mean, the viability in terms of uh, the commercial viability in any country. And it, it, it depends on what, what uh, source of renewable energy they're using. Uh, oftentimes, uh, renewable energy doesn't give you enough base load uh, in the country to be able to uh, have the, the level of uh, energy access you want. So normally it has to be combined uh, with uh, with other uh, sources of energy, and this is where the coal natural gas uh, debate comes in. Uh, and I, I think we should keep an open mind on natural gas uh, as long as it's using the cleanest possible technology, has the carbon has the storage carbon storage, and can be repurposed to cleaner energy like hydrogen. This is this is kind of the discussion that's going on. And um, I think for, for a country, whether you, what type of energy you use, including renewable, really depends on having a very strong uh, plan, a national plan uh, that clearly uh, uh, has a policy uh, that will give incentive, uh, the right incentive, the right policy environment for renewable uh, and, and clean energy versus you know, dirty energy. Or even get not and getting rid of, of dirty energy, and, and only in that instance will you get, I would say, the right uh, public-private partnership. Um, and and if it's, I don't, I'm not quite sure what you mean by extractive. Uh, if you're ha ha having extractive and then not benefiting the country, then obviously the planning is 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 not the right way to do it. They didn't do it the right way. They got to make sure that it's. It's benefiting the country first if they if before they export it. But sometimes there's a like a regional grid uh, sharing that that might be that might be what this is about. I'm probably not answering your question very well, but 
<laughs> that was a tough one. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, the next question is from uh, my colleague, Julie Mueller. She says, clearly the pandemic has magnified the global inequalities that already existed. And you've you know, mentioned some of this. Uh, she'd like you to talk specifically about what the bank has learned about uh, the sources of these global inequalities and how that's going to inform uh, and change future policy approaches. Uh, what we've learned is that, uh, you know, when, uh, I mean, pre-pandemic as well as, you know, whenever you design policies, you've got to make sure that it's inclusive. Uh, I think that that's really in what I would say in broad terms. But it means that you have to be uh, very uh, conscious and very cognizant uh, of, of, of the potential as well as the actual uh, inequality uh, outcomes. Um, and most of the time, and, and that's why data is very important. Um, and, and I think what we've learned uh, from this pandemic is the importance of data and the importance of having uh, what we call the digital ID system. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you, if you can have, uh, first of all, have a legal ID mm -hmm. and then have uh, uh, some kind of digital, uh, even if you don't have a digital uh, ID, have, have the, 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 the right a number, uh, the right ID of the person the disc and, and what that is the needs of that person. Because otherwise we don't know whether the program is, uh, 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 it, it's about targeting the right people with the right program uh, kind of uh, thinking. And, and we've learned a lot about, about this. And uh, I, I think after this pandemic, uh, a lot of the data that, that got built up during the pandemic, uh, you know, in, in many instances, we hope it can be built up uh, to to uh, not just deliver the emergency social support program or health program, but also to to develop skills building, uh, training, et cetera, et cetera, education. Uh, it, can, it can deliver education, skill, uh, jobs, financial access, uh, and so on. So uh, I think um, and, and knowing uh, uh, knowing the, the the source of the inequality. Uh, is you know that's why I think Clifford's uh, question was very important. We do a lot of that. You know, we we try to assess. <laughs> you have to have an, an idea about what what's happening on the ground. Uh, you know, just like uh, we do this, we've been doing this household surveys mm -hmm. uh, across. Uh, I, I think it's a, a lot of countries uh, at, as the as the pandemic is going on, and one of the findings was people eat less because their income dropped, yeah. right? Uh, and there's, therefore there's a food uh, insecurity problem. And to make it worse, women eat less than men because the women would give the food to the husband or to the children before she eats, right? So you, unless you then, you, then you have to think, okay, I need to have a food assistance program that is specifically for women. How do I do that, you know? Uh, I just give you an example of, of uh, how we, we, we really need to be, uh, have the right um, assessment so that we know uh, how to address the inequality. Uh, if you permit me, I'm going to sneak a follow up onto this question because you talked about the importance of data and the World Bank is sort of the gold standard in all of these different indicators, but even with the World Bank, particularly with conflict uh, ridden countries, uh, places where you have intractable conflict, how how does the World Bank deal with missing data and how is the World Bank able to do the kind of quality checks um, and simply obtain sufficient data? I mean, most governments don't, don't have the data on their own countries that the World Bank uh, has. How is that handled? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> Just came out with you know the, the world development report is the flagship knowledge product of the bank uh, and you know every year it'll uh, every 18 months uh, it will come out and it's usually a, a seminal topic and the one this year which was already launched uh, a few weeks ago is on data <laughs> and how data is needed for development outcomes so you know, uh, there's a lot in there, but uh, basically, uh, data is important for delivering effective programs. Data is also important for citizens to monitor the accountability of governments. 
and data in the private sector, as we can see, has led to the gig economy and so on. Uh, but how do you make sure that the data is, is not unequally, is leading to greater inequality and it's not misused, right? So there's a, a, a privacy issue, uh, usage and so on. But uh, uh, if, if, you, if your question is related to, to the one aspect that, that we are working on, which is countries need to have a national data authority. They have to create, uh, and it's usually not the statistical agency. Uh, it has to be uh, higher than that because it's it's uh, you know coordinating a lot of data. So uh, uh, they need to to have a national data uh, authority, uh, which will uh, which will which is trusted. That was the other thing, trust, right? If especially with digital ID, if if you're if you're the body that's holding the digital ID, you have to be a trusted and credible institution that's not going to you know, leak the data to the politicians or whatever and misuse it for human rights or whatever. So that the use and how do you set up the protocols for the use of that data becomes very important. So we're working with countries on that. So if uh, that, that's kind of uh, the ideal situation, but if you are talking about a conflict country or a country with no government, what do you do? Uh, that is a, a tough question. We have to work with, we usually work with uh, UN peacekeeping, Red Cross, those people on the ground and communities. Uh, it, it's imperfect. You just have to say, okay, uh, we know these people need help. And even if it's going to be missing the target, um, we, we can't, we can't, uh, we just, we just, we just know they need help. I'll give you a concrete example. You know, the, the, in, in developing countries, a large part of uh, the economy is what we call the informal sector. They're undocumented, they're unseen. Uh, so when you have a cash transfer program or you want to help small uh, micro enterprises, they don't, you can't help them because you don't know who they are. So what we, what uh, a lot of, uh, we advise a lot of countries is that just, uh, just expand your uh, household cash transfer program and you will probably hit the informal sector. So we just broaden the definition of households and increase the amount uh, that were given to households. Because, but we, you know, we don't know whether it really reached the informal sector or not, but we think it did because as long as you just do it broadly. So you just have to deal with it. And even in a country without a government, I'm just thinking uh, like Lebanon, you know, after the, the explosion, we, we went in to Lebanon to, to give the humanitarian help. You, you just have to think about helping the people even if there's no government and how do you, what is the right, who, whoever is on the ground. Uh, the final thing I would say is that technology uh, helps a lot. You know, you have to monitor, right? We're supposed to monitor the projects. How do you do it if, with COVID? You can't go to the field. So we have to, we, we say you, you need to have boots, eyes and ears on the ground. So you use local communities, local NGOs to take pictures, to take videos. You can use drones uh, also. So you need to, to, you can use technology effectively as well. Thank you for that. And on the matter of trust and credibility, I have a question from Nat Whitney on how, how does the World Bank ensure that money gets to the poor or gets where it's needed and isn't uh, sort of skimmed off the top? I mean, specifically, how, how does the World Bank ensure or reduce corruption? Oh, corruption has been a very big issue in the bank uh, since the time of Wolfenson. So we have very strict, uh, you know, whether it's starting from the project design, the procurement, uh, mm -hmm. the surveillance, the monitoring, uh, the, it's very strict. Uh, and uh, there is zero tolerance uh, for corruption. So uh, we, we, we monitor and we, we work with, uh, with governments to ensure that uh, you know, the protocols are there, the, the, the surveillance is there, the procurement systems are, are uh, you know, airtight in terms of um, uh, not, uh, of being uh, transparent, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, we have very strict, uh, very strict standards. Um, and uh, I don't think we've had any, any recent mishaps on that. I think there's been a long history of, of dealing with this uh, in a very strict way. And, you know, we we do, re, you know, CSOs are out there. We have people who watch the bank. <laughs> you have CSOs. I think there's even a group that calls themselves something or other uh, watching the bank. So, uh, you know, I think, um, I think we, 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 we work uh, very carefully because we know uh, this is so, such an important issue. 
Thank you. I'm going to take this question from Jackie. It's over in the chat. Um, and what she's asking about is the US and the other de developed countries and the industries in those countries have been receiving a lot of direct government aid during COVID. So, you know, governments putting money into their own people and their own institutions. And she's wondering if the bank has any data on whether or not this has helped uh, less developed countries in, uh -huh. in any way by keeping demand uh, at, at a more reasonable supply? Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it has. Uh, obviously, the, the positive news in 2021 is the recovery of the US economy. Uh, and uh, that will uh, help the global economy, global recovery, uh, help uh, create demand for those countries that, that can export. But um, it is, um, uh, what would you call it, uh, not even uh, countries that, uh, uh, that can export uh, and already part of the manufacturing global value chain or even the services global value chain, they benefit. But uh, there is a large number of least developed countries, poor countries who are not part of that, uh, or even within a country that can export to the US, the informal sector, which is not part of the export sector, will also not uh, benefit. So uh, yes, uh, there is a benefit, uh, but I think uh, uh, what, I, uh, what I concluded with in my opening remarks is what is important that 53% uh, you know, of growth comes from developing countries. So uh, developed countries growing alone is not going to be sufficient. Uh, we do need to address uh, how do we make sure that uh, developing countries can recover. And as they recover and build back, not just build back better, but build back differently, which is green, resilient, and inclusive. Thank you. A um, couple of uh, our audience would like to hear some more of your examples of cooperative systems and ways in which the bank has helped the private sector stimulate development in developing countries. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so it goes back to Clifford's earlier question about knowledge. So uh, the World Bank has uh, an, another part of it, which is called the IFC, International Finance Corporation they actually lend to the private sector. Uh, and in the last three years, four years, uh, there has been a better uh, linkage between the two where you know, private sector going into a, a developing country or you know, if you're trying to help the, the least developed countries and the fragile countries, uh, uh, it's high risk. So how do you reduce the risk for private investment? So what often happens is that uh, the bank will come in and do the analysis and the diagnostics to say, okay, this country needs to do reforms uh, in the energy sector and uh, reform the state-owned enterprises. Uh, and, uh, and by doing that, uh, they're creating the right investment environment um, for, uh, for the investment to come in. So there's a, there's a policy and institutional uh, changes that have to happen. Then the bank, as well as the IFC, uh, can come in the bank can actually give guarantees uh, and it can also come in with uh, some concessional funding, especially if it's a least developed country. We, we call that the IDA program. We can actually give concessional funding that will de-risk uh, the cost uh, for private sector. And the IFC uh, can also come in and, and invest in the private sector and then bring in uh, other private sectors. So that, that's one model. And we have many such uh, what we call public-private partnership models uh, where it can be IFC, it can be uh, other private sector that come in. But the idea is, you know, we need to create the right kind of investment environment. And to the extent that we, we have de-risking uh, financial instruments like mm -hmm. guarantees or coming in with concessional funding, uh, that's what we do. Thank you. Uh, just question came in from Doug Bates, also on data. He's asking if you seek the data, however informally, from sources such as the Grameen Bank, uh, Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, or other microcredit lenders like Oki Credit. Um, how useful is this data to uh, what the World Bank is doing? And I guess you know what sort of a relationship does the World Bank have, if any, with these micro uh, lenders? Yeah, of course. Um... Uh, there are many uh, what we call community-based um, either micro lending or self-help groups and to the extent that we we see that they have a good track record 
uh, and you know, uh, we, we don't, the World Bank doesn't lend uh, to, uh, to communities. The World Bank lends to governments and the government can then channel it to, to the communities or the self-help groups. And we've done that, like uh, a recent example is in India where uh, we uh, provided the loan to the government, but the government then channeled it to uh, 200 million uh, women, mm -hmm. a self-help, it's, it's, a, it's a network of self-help women's groups all over the country uh, to deliver social assistance uh, for women, right? Uh, so uh, we, we do that, but normally we do it through the government and we, you know, the government and us, we both vet uh, the, the, the outlet. So I, I, I think a lot of these uh, uh, organizations, whether it's Grameen Bank or micro, micro lending platforms that exist. Uh, and you know, they, they, once you can see that they have a track record uh, and, and obviously you want them to also be subject to good governance and transparency and so on and so forth. Um, and, and those are things that, that can be, that can, that, that can be um, evaluated. Uh, and we can then, uh, through the government, normally uh, channel channel the, the assistance. And, 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 and you can build programs on it, right? Uh, micro lending, okay, let's build the digital skills uh, for, for, the, for those who are borrowing, things like that. Thank you. Uh, for the last question, I'm going to take one that came in earlier by email asking specifically about the bank. Uh, the World Bank has a reputation, um, a favorable rep reputation in comparison with some of the other inter international uh, institutions, for example, the IMF, uh, the WHO. Why is it that the World Bank uh, has this uh, favorable reputation? What, what's the secret? <laughs> I'm not sure uh, what that really means. I because we do different things, right? right. Uh, so I, I think it's not a question of be better reputation or not. I think uh, if you talk about development, obviously the World Bank uh, has a good reputation because we are the largest uh, international bank, multilateral bank, uh, compared to regional banks. You have regional banks like ADB, IEDB, African Development Bank. But as a global bank, uh, we are the largest, and we have been um, uh, doing it for uh, seventy—is it seventy years? Uh, is that how old we are? Uh, Bretton Woods is no more than that, seventy-five, right? Bretton Woods turned seventy-five, I think, two years ago. So, uh, from the beginning of its creation, it was always about reconstruction, right? So about development. Uh, in the beginning, it wasn't developing countries per se, but it was reconstruction. So. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I would say it goes back, I keep on mentioning Clifford. So Clifford, you're, you, you started all this. Uh, it is because we have the knowledge, uh, you know, we come not just with the financing, but we also come with knowledge and learning, right? We, if you talk about crisis, we experience financial crisis, health crisis. So we've had, we have a body of experience, even though this crisis is no, like no other crisis but we can borrow uh, different parts of different crises to see what worked and what didn't work. And what there's a, a lot of cross country global learning to be done. And that's, I think that's really the strength of the bank because even when I was a, a trade minister, I would always say, okay, I have to reform my investment law. Can you tell me uh, what similar countries did five years ago before they reform, you know, what, what did they do? What, what, what was the, what did their law look like? And what, how did they get the political uh, support, blah, 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 you know? And then they would come and give me all the case studies of the different, of different countries. And then of course, nothing, uh, it's not like a cookie cutter. Uh, it's not, uh, you just cut and paste. You have to figure out what works in your country, but it helps to know what has worked and what has not worked. Um, and uh, the final thing I would say is that uh, the World Bank has, a lot of people working there and a lot of them have uh, what we call the taxit knowledge it's there in their in their heads and because they've had you know they've been in country offices they've been in three different regions so they have the the experience that is um, that is very valuable when, when they when they are faced with with an issue and I, I found this so incredible in the, in this last one year working in this institution Thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for all these questions. Bill, I'm gonna hand it back to you at this point. 
Okay, Allison, thank you very much. Dr. Pangestu, that was remarkable. That was really an energetic evening for us. I mean, I just can't get over. I think this was a great conclusion to our spring series. So I have to thank you so much for honoring us with your time. I think it was absolutely terrific. I have to say, I'm quite confident that you're on the job and this is gonna be good for the World Bank and good for the world. And it really does, I think your talk conveys the importance of international institutions to all of us. I think maybe it's something that may be a little bit invisible, but I think clearly you demonstrated that tonight. Uh, you know, your work is so important because we wanna live in a world that is secure, prosperous, healthy, sustainable, and equitable. And I think that's what the World Bank is working toward as well. So this was a great evening and I really wanna thank you for your presence. Uh, I think you did an absolutely terrific job. Clifford, uh, you're a pretty good moderator too. I'll give you some credit in this. <laughs> thank you for yes. being here. My pleasure. <laughs> thank so you. thank you very much. And it was thank wonderful. You. Yes, my pleasure. And thank, thank you, you to much. all of our audience and our sponsors. This is the last webinar of the spring season. Our next event will be our annual dinner on June 23rd with Maine Health's Dora Ann Mills. Details on that event will be in our next Community Connections newsletter. So again, thanks everyone, our speakers, moderator, Allison, everyone who came tonight and uh, have a very good evening. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Judith and uh, Greg. I didn't know you were one of the sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll see you in Maine. <laughs> okay, anytime. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. This concludes our seminar webinar for the evening. Thank you everyone and have a good night. <laughs>